morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. Let me open with Scripture. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Father, thank you this morning that we can gather, we can uh, come together as a church, whether online or in person this morning. Several are joining us. And I just I thank you, God, that we can gather, we can open up your scriptures, we can sing these uh, songs to you and worship you in the, this new year. And I am optimistic and excited for the things that you can do this coming year. How you will mold us and transform us and cause us to grow and long for you even more this year. In your name I pray. Amen. Join us as we sing our opening hymn this morning. We have a new helper. Stand with me, please. Uh, it's on page one in your hymnal. We'll sing the uh, four verses.
Join me as we say the Lord's Prayer together this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just a few announcements uh, today. Olivia's going to pull those up for us. We have a board meeting right after uh, the service this morning. Kids class, adult Bible study, youth group will all resume next week. Are there any other announcements today? Janie. Take them. If you want your poinsettias, text me and come pick them up. There you go. Uh, for those on watching online, um, anything else this morning? Yep. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you want to sponsor a meal for those watching. Uh, for a youth group, just see or text Christina, and that would be fine. Um, anything else? Any other announcements? No? All right. Uh, birthdays. There's a few this week and anniversary. Uh, Peyton, where are you? There you are, Peyton, has a birthday today. Uh, Mary Trevarthen, who's watching this morning, and Judy has a birthday this week. Let's sing happy birthday. Then, John and Lori Holmes, who I know are watching as well this morning, have an anniversary uh, this week, so let's sing happy anniversary to them. And I believe there's some kind of thing. Yeah, can't see them this time, but that's okay. Um, prayer and praise. Any prayer requests, praises? Yep. I came in here last week before service last week. And I think it's golden green. Am I right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Um, and thank you, Perry and Sabrina, for filling in for us last week. We really appreciate it. Well, it was uh, it was a good little getaway. So uh, Christine and I got a few days, and it was just nice. Kids got to swim a little, so that was good too. So, uh, yes, and Amy, I know, helped out. Yeah, we were watching, but uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we appreciate that, though. Uh, yeah. Uh, my cousin Hannah got married yesterday and during all of the Christmas time, and so I didn't get a 
Yeah. Yeah. They they wanted a uh, short, quick wedding, so that's what we did. So it went well. Uh, anything else? Uh, I texted with her either yesterday or the day before. She says she's just really tired. So uh, pr continue. Yeah, pray for her. Yeah, and uh, John and Mason now. Uh, yeah. So just, I guess they're just tired and coughing. Not, doesn't sound like the bad, the worst of it, but um, hopefully they will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So keep them in your prayers, though. They asked this morning um, that you would. Anything else? I have one more. Yeah. Oh. Sure. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and then one more, uh, Daryl shared with me, Shirley Eckerty's uh, brother, Jack McQueen, died yesterday. So let's pray their family. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Um, the more I talk to, the more people who have been experiencing the same sorts of things. So, uh, as far as churches go. So, yeah, definitely. Anything else? All right, let's take a few moments of silent prayer and then I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning bringing our praises and our requests before you. Father, first I ask for prayer for John and Samantha and Mason as they battle uh, the COVID and just pray for them that you will give them strength, that they will uh, be well in all that they've uh, gone through this year and uh, will go through and uh, many in our community are going through right now. I just pray for their well-being for their safety and for their healing, that you will uh, give them the strength to get over this quickly. Father, you truly are the great healer, and we trust you, and we look to you for our strength and our help in times of need. Lord, I, I pray this morning uh, for Christina's Uncle Ken, that, uh, that things will keep progressing, that you will protect him. Please keep healing him, Father, and as he battles all these things as well, just uh ask that the, the donor situation will get figured out and will be able to be accomplished here soon in the coming weeks. We thank you for how you've brought him to this point. 
and we just pray that you will guide him and hold him as he goes further into it. Lord, I thank you for Hannah, who was able to get married yesterday, and all the challenges they, they face through this process. Just thank you that we get to uh, uh, be there and experience that yesterday, and I pray that they will have a, a good marriage. Father, I uh, pray for Brad as he uh, battles uh, melanoma and the, the coming struggles in his trip to Indianapolis to figure out the best uh, route for that. I pray that you will uh, heal him, give him uh, wisdom as decisions I'm sure will have to be made and that you will heal his body. Lord, I pray for uh, Shirley's brother Jack's family as, as he passed away, that you will give them peace during this time of loss and mourning and that their uh, grief will not stay grief, but will turn into uh, joy over time, just as Ecclesiastes tells us. And Lord, I pray for our church. And as we enter this new year, as we look back and we can learn many things, but as we face the new challenges and the new opportunities lying ahead, Lord, I pray for excitement. I pray for a continual personal spiritual growth uh, for all those who are here and watching this morning that we will continue to look to Christ for our hope and our sufficiency. And in your name I pray. Amen. Join me as we sing our communion song this morning. It's on page 239. We'll sing the first and the last. you take your communion cup out uh, and get that prepared, I'll read from the book of Luke. It says, Jesus took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to them, the disciples, saying, this is My body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in My body blood. Let us pray. Father, thank You this morning that we can gather, we can take communion together, we can remember all that Christ has done for us, and I pray it's at these times, this coming year, that we truly rely and we see our hope that Christ gave His body and His blood for us, that we might have eternal life. And I am thankful for that truth today. And in Your name I pray. Amen. All right, as you finish up, go ahead and take out your Bible. Uh, notes are there in the bulletin uh, for you. There's some uh, questions there for you as well. 
uh, for application later, but we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. Very familiar passage, a passage that I have uh, referenced many times, read many times, but as this new year begins, uh, I understand. Last year was challenging. There were things that uh, we didn't expect would happen this time last year, and in some ways, it felt like the whole year was just a blur. And so I understand, and there's going to be new challenges this year as well, but I also believe there's going to be opportunities uh, for us as a church and as, uh, as a people. I, I believe that there are uh, places that we can turn to this year uh, no matter what uh, comes our way, uh, whether it's struggles, whether it's uh, uh, mental uh, issues, uh, depression, anxiety, whatever it may be, I believe that as a people of God, we have one thing that we can look to, and that is the Scriptures. And we're going to dive into that this morning and look at it more further. But my, my total goal this morning, and for this year really, is that we will be making much of the Word uh, this coming year in 2021. That is my goal. That's going to be my focus, and I pray it's your focus as well. So uh, let's dive in here. First, Believers should prepare to endure. Now, let's look at verses 10 through 11. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. My patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, uh, with persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Now this is Paul. He, he's talking to Timothy, and I know we're jumping in kind of midway through the book, and uh, there's no background what led up to this point, but uh, Paul is talking to Timothy, and he uses an interesting word. He uses that, uh, you however. Now, uh, we know that is a transitional word. He, it's referring to, it used to be like this, but I'm telling you to be like this. Now, what's he referring to? Well, if you look back a few verses up, you'll see there were people that Paul was describing in a very uh, negative way leading up to what he's getting ready to say. He says, uh, as he describes these people, if you look up uh, through verses uh, 1 through 9, he says, uh, there will be times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, They'll be proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. They'll be treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And he says, Stay away from these people. It, it might sound rather familiar to our current culture as we look at this. I, I don't think it's that much different. Paul is basically saying that he and Timothy's life should be the exact opposite of this. And therefore, our lives should be the exact opposite of who Paul is describing in those verses leading up to our passage today. Now, Paul is making a personal Appeal And it's hard to, you have to really read into. Paul and Timothy, they had a very father-son-like uh, relationship. That they, he, he was very personal. And you don't find this all throughout Paul's writing, but you find it here with Timothy. There was something special about Timothy and the way Paul would talk to him. He, he made things very personal. And you see this by, he lists these three cities here. Now, these were cities that were very personal to Paul and were personal to Timothy. You see, Paul, on his first missionary journey, traveled to these cities and established churches there. Now, they meant a great deal to him, and he was saddened by the path that these churches had started to take. Well, Timothy, he grew up around these cities. He knew these cities very well. So Paul is saying, Timothy, listen to me. This is personal for me. This is not just some other message for the church. This is for you. This is for me. And therefore, it's for us this morning. I like to think about it 
uh, in many ways, but you can give a personal uh, presentation on a subject that you are familiar with. But if you have somebody, uh, I could stand up here and talk a little bit about farming and we wouldn't get very far. But if I asked Perry to come up here, he could tell you a lot and have that personal uh, touch to it that only he can have. And that's what Paul is doing here with Timothy. He's saying, I'm telling you this, but I've lived these things. I've gone through the persecutions. I've gone through the suffering. I've gone through these cities that I established churches in, and they're falling away now, and I, I'm saddened about it. He has that personal touch. This is what Paul is trying to teach Timothy. It's not in some bragging way that you could possibly read into this text, but he's just saying, I, I, I've been there. I have the credentials. I know what I'm talking about because I've lived it. So what does he tell Timothy? Does he give him some huge encouraging message? No, he does not. Let's see it. Look at verses 12 through 13. Believers should expect persecution. Verse 12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul is not going to win any awards for being the best motivational speaker, right? Uh, he, you're, you read this and you say, oh, Paul, all these things, and you tell me I'm going to be persecuted as well. It's, it's not at the top of your goal list for 2021, but uh, I, I think it's a reality. Paul is laying the groundwork for something that's going to be far better and far bigger than what we could ever imagine. Now, um, Matthew 16, 24, it says, Olivia will pull it up there for us. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Believers, uh, you and I, and we've seen it this past year, and we're going to see, I think, more of this ramping up. Persecution is going to come our way. Uh, I think the levels of it, and we, we don't experience it really here in America. There's levels of it, but in other countries, I read some 2,000-some uh, Nigerian Christians were killed this last year. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't experience things like that here. Now, I believe it's going to ramp up, and I believe we should be ready. You see, persecution, suffering as a Christian uh, is part of or an element of Christian living. It's something that we should be expecting. Jesus said, expect to be persecuted. You see, I heard someone once say that, you know, Jesus, look how his life was. He, he was uh, rejected. He was uh, hung on a cross. He was tortured for his teachings. Why should we as his followers, expect anything different. And I don't believe we should. We should expect those times to come uh, as a Christian, even in America. But believers know evil will exist until Jesus returns. Evil remains because sin remains. Sin affects every aspect uh, of our living here. Uh, everything we look at, we can attribute those negative uh, side effects to sin. It, 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 we can't escape it. As Christians, we can't escape it. Uh, it it's going to be all around us. So what's the hope? Where do we turn? Look at verses 14 through 15. Believers should remember their doctrine. Believers should remember their doctrine. In verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In the midst of this persecution, Paul tells Timothy, remember your heritage. You see, Timothy had been raised by godly uh, a mother and a, and a grandmother, and Paul's influence as well. And he's, he's taken Timothy back there. He says, don't forget what you have learned. Don't forget these key 
doctrinal truths that you have learned throughout your whole life because it will be these things. He, he calls them the sacred writings, and this commonly refers to the Scriptures. He's saying, hold to these truths because they will be your source of hope when hard times come. When all is not clear, the Word does not change. You see, the Word remains clear when all hope is lost. And we can look to the Word for just that. I, I once read a story about a ship captain. And um, he, he's out and he's, uh, it's late, it's dark, and, and he's, he knows he's close to rocky edges and he knows he has to get into the, to the ports. And he, he's going through and he can't see anything and he's, he's scared. He's going to hit those jagged uh, rocks that he knows are close by and all of a sudden he starts seeing something he sees this light come through and all of a sudden you see as he's looking out he sees this lighthouse beaming through the darkness and I believe as we enter this year that we have a light that will beam through the darkness and I believe it's the scriptures I believe it truly is the word of God that will be a light to us, will be an encouragement, a hope to us in the midst of the dark world that we, we go through, we navigate every day. We, we have to, you know, wind through, and sometimes we get off, and I think this last year for most of us, we had those moments of really struggling, of seeing the darkness, and really being overcome by it. But you know what I come back to every time is this light that we have. We have the light of the Scriptures to guide us and give us hope when all else seems hopeless. The Word serves as a lighthouse to those who are struggling, to those who are going through hard times. When all doesn't make sense, the Word still is steady. It's truth. Last. Look at verses 16-17. through We're going to spend more time on this one. Believers should embrace the Scriptures. Believers should embrace the Scriptures. It's not enough to just know them. We must embrace them as well. It says in verse 16, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Why should someone embrace these Scriptures? Why? Because they are authoritative. You see, when we come to the Scriptures, we come to not just another book, not just another thing or chapters or whatever you want to look at it as. It's not just something else. These are the very words of God that He had the Holy Spirit inspire. You see, it says all Scripture is breathed out by God. Now, in our context, that's referring to the Old Testament as Paul's speaking here. But by implication, it refers to the entirety of the canon, the 66 books of the Scriptures that we hold in our hands. Now, breathed out by God. This is one of the most important expressions in the New Testament. Uh, it impacts our doctrine, our devotion, the way we view uh, the Scriptures, the, the, the fact that they are inspired by God. Now, this is why when you read your books of the Bible, and depending on who's writing, you're going to see different styles. You see, God used these men's different styles to write His Scriptures, but he, uh, it was as if the Holy Spirit is guiding them along as they do it. Not a word was penned that He did not want to be penned. 2 Peter 1.21 For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, it is truly the Spirit's role. It was His role to produce the Word of God. And now consider what you know about God. He is perfect. He is truth. He is holy. Therefore, when Scripture speaks... God speaks. When we open up this Word, God is speaking to us as we read this Word. It also says all Scripture is profitable for something. 
all Scripture is profitable for what? First it says teaching. Now 2 Peter 1.3 captures this as well. It says His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. The Word gives us instruction that we need to live a godly life. Now, is it going to hit on every little detail or every little decision we have to make in life? Maybe not directly, but indirectly, it will have some implications that we can apply to those decisions and how to live this godly life. You see, God didn't say, you're a Christian, figure it out. He gave us what we need to live this life for Him. It also says, uh, for teaching and for reproof. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, we hold something here that is very, very powerful. The Word has power like nothing else. No other book we can hold in our hands. The Scripture often rebukes us. That's why when we come to passages and Uh, something may rub us the wrong way, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes we need to be rubbed or called out uh, for those sins that we have allowed to creep into our lives. Again, we're all impacted by sin. We need to be called out by the Scriptures. But not just that. He says it's for uh, teaching, for reproof, and correction. See, Scripture not only rebukes wrong behavior, but it also points the way back to godly living. See, anytime Scripture calls out a particular sin in our lives, it's also going to give us the alternative. Don't lie, tell the truth. Easy example, but the Scripture speaks to these things. And then last, it says, training in righteousness. Scripture provides positive training in godly behavior, not merely uh, just rebuke and correction, of wrong behavior. The Word of God teaches us. It reproves us. It corrects us. But also, it it trains us in how to live this life. This godly life that He has for us. Now, the Scriptures, they're not just uh, authoritative, but they're also sufficient. They're also sufficient. Now, uh, Olivia, pull this next quote up on the board. Uh, I found this. I think it, he captures it very well. Uh, it says the sufficiency of scriptures means that scripture contains all the words of God he intends it, his people to have at each stage of redemptive history. And that it now contains all the words of God we need for salvation, for trusting him perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. You see, the, our passage this morning, verse 16, says. Uh, that the man or woman of God may be complete. That that word can also mean uh, perfect. Uh, In some translations, they actually translate it that way, that we might be complete or perfect. You see, this is part of that sanctification process that we go through as Christians, that as we try and strive to become more like Christ, trusting in God, relying on Him to help us, uh, relying on the Holy Spirit to illumine this Word to us so that we know how to do these things, we become more like Christ. We become more like that perfect person that is being described here. But notice, in order to do that, it's not going to come just from some magical, you know, I can't just wave my Bible above my head or something like that or put it under my pillow at night. That's not going to work, as we know. Test takers, you know, you've all tried it. All the methods of listening at night to it on your phone while you sleep and all those different things that we tried when we were in school, none of them work. You can't just wave this Bible above your head. It's not going to work. We have to be in it. We have to read it. We have to know it and apply it to our Word that we may be fully equipped for every good work as our passage says. The Word not only accomplishes this in the life of the man of God, but in all who follow Him. We need the Word to become 
more mature in Christ, and the Word will equip us to do just that. You see, it's the Word that we need this coming year. God has given His people a a powerful weapon, a powerful tool that we hold in our hands this morning, or maybe you're holding it on your, you're reading it on your phone. We have a very powerful weapon before us uh, that we can face this coming year uh, like, like no one else. Christians have a unique opportunity to hold something that is true and trustworthy and proven in our hands and face this year like no one else. We can have hope because of these Scriptures this coming year. Let me close with this. Uh, we do have a baptism this morning, so I'm cutting it short this morning. But uh, I read this in a devotion this last week. Olivia will pull it up for you. But it says, Your need to seek God never ends. Seeking God means that you are continually aiming and working at knowing Him more deeply, depending on Him more thoroughly, and experiencing His grace more richly. Seeking God means that in all you do, you keep His honor in your mind, His word in your heart, and His glory as your goal. So you are seeking to actually know Him and make Him known. See, just as Paul encouraged Timothy to press on in the midst of the persecution that he should expect, I encourage you this coming year, press on. Seek God. Use the weapons you have before us. Use the weapon God has given you personally to face this battle head on and to have victory in it. My goal, and I challenge you, let's dive into the Word and make much of it this coming year in 2021. Let me pray. Father, thank You this morning that we can trust You. We can rely on You. We have hope in You. You are a good God and You, uh, in Your grace and in Your love, have given us uh, this Bible that we can hold and we can know and we can uh, learn from. And even as we see the men and women throughout the Scriptures who had ups and downs in their life, I believe we can relate to and we can see how many came out more faithful. And I pray that that is our goal this year. And in Your name I pray. Amen. All right. Mom, daughter, why don't you guys go get ready? I'm going to get ready. Olivia's going to take care of uh, some music, and uh, we'll be right back.
All right, I have, we have Peyton here, and uh, we've been, this has been kind of a longer journey than what we originally thought it would be, but uh, Peyton has come with the desire to be baptized. We've met, she's uh, answered some tough questions, and I believe uh, has a good understanding of what this Christian life would be like, right? Yes. Uh, it is a little warmer than we expected, so uh, she's trying not to uh, burn up in here. But uh, either way, uh, let me read a passage. There are two ordinances in the scriptures that we find that Jesus commanded us to do. One, we've already observed this morning uh, by taking communion, and the second is simply baptism. Now, as Peyton and I have discussed, does baptism save you? No, don't be too nervous. Uh, uh, baptism does not save. Uh, baptism is just, this is just water. However, God gave us baptism to show uh, that you're a Christian, and she is publicly expressing today that she is a Christian to all of you. And now there's a lot of things that come with that. We hold her accountable. She's accountable to us, and it's, a, it's what part of being in the family of God is all about. But let me read a passage here in Matthew 28. Jesus is talking, it's kind of his last words in Matthew. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I'm glad that's what we get to celebrate today. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you today that we get to celebrate uh, Peyton. We get to celebrate her, uh, not only her earthly uh, birthday, but we get to celebrate a, a spiritual birthday as well today. And we are grateful for it. And we pray for many good days ahead as she learns and, and navigates this Christian life. And in your name I pray. Amen. Based on your 